Hey everyone, so people have seen my anvil set up multiple times, you know, I've done videos with it. A lot of people have commented on it because I use a 200 year old Sawyer's anvil. And I also have a 210 year old Queen's Dudley, at least two thirds of one. Uh, and they are beautiful pieces of history which I am privileged enough to be able to work on. However, they're not mine. They're on loan to me, very generously I might add. And uh, while that is a very nice situation to be in, because they're on loan for as long as I need them, they're still not mine. And the only anvils that I actually own myself are uh, my little 20 kilo cast steel unit, which I use to take to fairs and shows that I do, because it's, you know, it's portable, it's carryable. I also have a custom rail track anvil with a forklift tie top that was made for me by Lucas at Alpha Wolf Forge. Um, that thing is quite clacky and loud, um, but I don't use it as a normal forging anvil, I use it as a striking anvil. And the extended horn on it I had put on there because my uh, 20 kilo cast anvil has a square horn. And I didn't really want to grind it back into a round horn, uh, just in case I needed the square horn. So. I've been thinking for a long time, especially since I've been full time as a blacksmith and bladesmith for the last two years now, um, at least, <laughs> more than two years, uh, and being a full time maker, the tools that I use are very important, so it was time for me to invest in a proper anvil that was mine, that I can actually, um, you know, modify if I need to, which is a, a thing we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and you know, I don't feel terrified that something's going to happen to it when it's on loan to me, and frankly, a probably priceless piece of history. So, um, I have done a video in the past of the things that you need to consider and look for when shopping for second-hand anvils, and I'll link that up there. But what about when you're looking for a new anvil? Now, after a lot of looking around, I found, um, uh, you know, a lot of research as well. <laughs> too much research. I took a long time doing this. Way too long, if any of you have been following my work. But I found the anvils that were being supplied by a lovely fellow called Bruce Beamish, right here in Australia. And he produces this amazing double horn anvil in various sizes, and I opted to pick a 40 kilo one of his models. Um, and it actually just arrived this morning, so I thought we could, you know, it's, it's literally still in the crate. I figured we could actually open it up together and take a look at the same time. So I'll be honest, we've all seen horror stories of badly packaged anvils. <laughs> just like covered in cling wrap and strapped to a pallet. And funnily enough, my 20 kilo anvil was just that. It was zip tied to a small pallet uh, and covered in cling wrap. That's no way to ship an anvil. I've seen them shipped in cardboard boxes before. An anvil in a cardboard box. That's not good. But I was very pleasantly surprised to find a big old plywood crate. Not MDF or chipboard, plywood. Screwed down uh, and no rattle, nothing in there. I'm very keen to see how this thing is mounted inside there because there is no movement at all. And this thing actually broke the delivery man's trolley when he was dropping it off. It's only 40 kilos, but it's just mounted really solidly. So let's get this thing open and uh, see what it looks like in there. How's that? Nailed down as well as screwed. That is a solidly packed anvil. <laughs> Should have bought a pro bar, pry bar with me. You know what? I'm going to get a pry bar. Whoa. That is exciting. I am very excited. Ha ha ha!
That is lovely. Now, there's a bizarrely controversial thing about uh, the Anyang anvils, and that is that when you get them delivered, they are slightly magnetic. That's pretty normal. I'll tell you why. If you work in an anvil production factory, you have to move them a lot, and uh, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, my boy Big Fudge has an 80 kilo one, and they go up to some pretty redonkulous sizes, frankly. I only wanted the 40 kilo. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to move it on my own. But uh, if you get bigger and bigger ones, for workplace health and safety reasons, you have to use lifters to actually move these things around. And the easiest way to uh, operate a lifter is using an electromagnetic lifter, which comes down from the top, clonk, turns on the electromagnet, picks the um, anvil up and moves it. You could use straps, but that would actually require somebody on the floor to connect the straps to the anvil in order to be able to lift it up. A magnetic lifter doesn't need that. It's much more efficient. And electromagnets, when you are electrifying a, um, a big hunk of steel like this, because these are cast steel, it leaves some magnetic residue. Now, some people have an issue with this when they first get it. They think, oh, I can't use a magnetized anvil, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out about that. Firstly, hot steel should be past its curie temperature. If you're forging on it, it should be at least past its curie temperature. Uh, otherwise, you're just introducing a lot of stress. Now, steel that is past its curie temperature is non-magnetic, which means you won't feel anything. The second thing is, I seem to be the only person out there who paid attention in high school physics. The way to demagnetize a piece of metal is to repeatedly hit it with a hammer. That's right. And what do you use an anvil for? What do you do with it all day? You hit it with a hammer. So let me show you what I mean. So let's test that theory. Magnetic. Right. One hammer, two hammer. Let's make some music. Well, that was noisy. Anyway, let's grab our bar. All right, it's still a little bit there. Like this is after like 30 seconds already. Oh, I got it. <laughs> it's so hard to actually get it to stick now. It's so much less magnetic than it was. 30 seconds, guys. So these come with uh, a very light chamfer around the edges. And this is so that you can have a sharp corner. Um, it's probably not a good idea to actually have a 90 degree corner on your anvil. Some people like to do that. I would recommend against it because it's kind of asking for cold shuts. Having a very slight chamfer, and this is probably like a, a millimeter and a half, maybe, at, at its widest chamfer around it, prevents cold shuts. However, I like to have a radius corner on my anvils, um, just for when I'm doing bending tasks and things, it makes it a lot easier. But, because this comes without a radius corner edge on it, it allows you to put it in the place that is the most convenient for the style of work you do and the orientation in which you want to have the anvil. I'm going to put mine on the end of the scrolling step, or shelf, I should say, um, and that allows me to go over the back, which is my preferred style when doing bends. I like to go over the back rather than over the side. So that will be the next modification that I do. Having the freedom to modify your anvil in this way is one of the biggest pros of buying a new anvil instead of a second-hand one, because a second-hand one has had possibly multiple smiths all modifying it in their own little ways to be comfortable for them, whereas when you buy a new one, it is crisp, it is clean, and you can modify it and customize it to be exactly perfect for the way that you work. So let's have a talk about the features of these anvils. Now, 
the different sizes come with different features a um, little bit. I mean, we'll talk about the, the, the holes on the top uh, a little bit later, but the main thing you'll probably notice about this is that it is a double horn style, very sort of uh, uh, German double horn style format, form factor. Uh, and that gives you the benefit of having both a square horn and a round horn. Uh, not too sharp the round horn is, because traditionally you kind of want a bit of a point on a round horn if you're going to be doing delicate work. Square horns, though, there's not much point having them sharp, so this one's a little bit blunter. Um, plenty of surface area to work on this dimension, but you'll also notice this cool little number. Now, I've never owned an anvil that has one of these, and I've always wanted one, and it was one of the large reasons why I liked this anvil over others that I was uh, able to buy in my country. This is called a scrolling shelf, or sometimes a face shelf, and it allows you to actually have the advantages of the length this way, this way. So let's just say you're forging in the bevels of a knife, you don't necessarily have to move around your anvil and try and work by hanging tongs back here and then putting it along the face and then dealing with the pritchel holes, you have about the same distance here as you do here. It also gives you this nice little uh, isolated section that you can curl material over because this angles out. So you can do scrolling around underneath or over the back in the style that I prefer to, to actually do. So this is a really, really handy thing to have. It's also, um, kind of handy when it comes to making Damascus because the smaller volume of this piece of steel means that it doesn't act as much of a heat sink when you place a screaming hot billet on top of it. This much mass under the body, you put hot steel there and all of the heat gets sucked into the body of the anvil, whereas this small amount of mass bleeds it out at a much slower rate. Very, very handy. One particularly cool thing I'd like to note about this horn is that this here is my two-thirds of a Queen's Dudley anvil, and this is quite an archetypal-shaped horn. Look at it right down the barrel, and you'll notice that the horn is not round. It's kind of ovular this way with a flat spot on top, and that is a fairly traditional way to do things. However... It's not always the nicest shape to actually use. You really want more roundness over the top, because if you're trying to forge something that is a circle, you can't really do it on a traditional sort of London pattern style horn because of that flattened top. Whereas on the Beamish anvil, if we look down the barrel of this one, you can notice that it is perfectly circular. It is a conical horn that is canted up so that the top of it runs uh, in line with the face of the anvil. However, it is nice and round, really, really round. And that allows you to forge curves much, much easier. And also, when you're doing drawing out, get much better actual movement of the steel because there is a smaller surface area on top. That's a cool little feature. Now, the top face of this anvil is nice and long. It's nice and wide at about maybe three and a half, four inches wide for this particular model. It scales up, obviously, as you get the heavier ones. These go up to about 240 kilos, depending on the model that you want. Uh, I mainly make knives, so my uh, needs are pretty much contained entirely in this 40 kilo model. But you'll notice very different to other types of anvils that you may have seen. It has multiple pritual holes. Now, in addition to the uh, standard inch square hardy hole, which is really nice. If you've ever gotten a secondhand anvil and then had the really bizarre size hardy holes, you'll know what a treat that is to just have straight inch square. But in addition to that, you have multiple size pritual holes. Now, obvi the obvious thing is that you can use different size pritual tooling, like hold fasts for various sizes, but it also acts as like an impromptu drift plate for when you're punching holes in stock. If you are trying to punch a hole in a piece of stock that is, whoop, moving the camera, 
in a punched piece of stock that is only this big, if you try and put it over a hardy hole, a pritchel hole that big, the entire thing's going to bow down into the hole. So you actually have a smaller hole like this. That's what a drift plate is for. Uh, and normally it's a separate piece of tooling. This anvil has them built in three different standard sizes. The larger models have four different sizes on them because they have a much larger face. But being able to have the room in both angles, that is just absolutely gorgeous and I'm very, very happy with it. The flatness, the milled flatness that this comes as stock is mind blowing. And actually you can still see the mill marks on it for where it's been trued up and it just feels crispy. I really, really like it. There's that chamfer that you can see that they've put in there. Very, very light chamfer. I've rounded this over, as is my style, uh, and is what is comfortable for my work ethic. But yeah, that is a very, very nice anvil face with uh, a lot of very useful slots and holes cast into it. Now the final old feature that I like, um, not as important on an anvil that's only 40 kilos, but on some of the larger models this would be very, very handy, is um, you can see it hiding under the chains. The reason I've got it chained up is because I, I don't do the style of work that requires it. But it's nice to know it's there if ever I need it. This is called an upsetting shelf. Um, so attached to the bottom of some anvils, actually cast into the shape of the anvil are these blocks. Now you can have uh, a long piece of bar that you are trying to upset. Let me try and find an example here. So let's just say you are trying to thicken up this end. You don't have to do it into the face of your anvil, which can actually damage the face and scuff it up and put undue wear onto it. So a well-designed anvil has one of these shelves where you can sit it there and it is actually in a much more convenient place. Because it's down low, you don't have to raise your hammer quite as high to get over the top and strike down on the top of the work. You can just put it there and hammer on it comfortably. So, bonus points for the upsetting shelf, even though I'm probably not going to use it in my work. Now it's been talked about a lot, I've talked about it. Uh, there was a whole big discussion about it on YouTube for a while about the importance of rebound and anvil. And my stance is always staunchly that rebound is good in an anvil simply because of the physics principle of Young's modulus of elasticity and the energy transference. So I am still of the firm belief that good rebound is, is uh, uh, absolutely essential if you're going to actually make an anvil be a workhorse. So a steel ball, this is about a 30 mil steel ball bearing, uh, hardened, 50 to 100 really good test and if you'll remember from my second hand video I like to drop it onto the anvils and see how far it bounces back up and I gauge the rebound of an anvil based on that. My Sawyer's anvil, which you've all seen before, while it's a lovely anvil, Sawyer's anvils by their very nature are made to be a bit softer than your average anvil and that's for specific reasons of their use. This however, have a look at this rebound. So. Put that there. Whoop! <laughs> I hit the edge. That's at least a 95% rebound. That is bonkers good. That is really incredible. That means for the amount of force that you are striking down, the anvil is striking back with 95% of the force that you strike with, hitting the other side of the material as well, giving you maximum impact penetration. That is great, and that's what you want to see if you're shopping for a new anvil. Now the reason that rebound is so good comes from the alloy that this is cast from. It is a cast steel anvil made of 6150 steel. And 6150 is an incredibly hardening alloy. Uh, now, these are checked at the factory and are going to be at least a Rockwell of 58, which is phenomenal. 58 is starting to get up into the, the knife hardness ranges, which is pretty cool. Um, and, and, you know, that's why you get that good rebound. And good rebound is just essential. It saves your shoulder, it saves your elbow, and it makes you work more efficiently. 
And really, if you're going to be spending money on buying a new anvil, you really need to consider what it's made from. A lot of anvils are cast iron with, a, if you're lucky, a welded on faceplate, uh, but oftentimes not. So uh, necessarily finding something cheaper isn't always better because you need to find out what it's made from, what sort of rock well you can get out of it, and how good it's actually going to be as an anvil. I mean, an anvil has one job. It better do it well. Now, time to do some forging on this thing, I reckon. And uh, the first thing I'm going to have a play around with is some fairly hefty stock. Just, you know, it's a new anvil, I want to whale on it. <laughs> but my previous anvil, the only other anvil that I had that had a hardy hole in it, had a really weird size of 16 millimeter hardy hole. Very, very strange. And all of my hardy tooling is set up for 16 millimeter. Uh, this new anvil from Bruce is actually 25 millimeter or one inch or just over one inch So you can use inch square bar and just drop it straight in. I don't have any inch square bar I've got 30 mil square bar, so I just need to bring it down just a touch on the sides Upset the end just a little bit and that way I can uh, make a shank for a hardy tool and if you saw from my last video, I need a fullering tool. So that'll be a really cool first project for it to make a big chunky tanged hardy tool for fullering swords. Notice here that my hammer blows are bouncing all over the place, and this is actually me getting used to the bounce on this thing. The rebound factor that this anvil has is huge, and after working on a Sawyer's anvil for so long, uh, this thing's rebound is just incredible, incredible to work with. I'm just not very used to it yet. <laughs> the practice makes perfect. That went really well, so the next thing I'm going to just have a play around with it's not for any particular project but anyone who follows me knows that I do a lot of sort of small forged jewelry sort of stuff and it involves a lot of scrolls and little uh, tight curls and things so I'm going to see how easy it is to do a nice neat round completed scroll um, just like a, like a hanging loop on the end of something uh, just to try out that shelf try out that pointed horn the round horn and uh, we'll see how it behaves So all in all, I couldn't be more pleased. I tend to be a little bit over honest with things sometimes. <laughs> I was expecting to find more wrong, uh, more things that I didn't like about this. But honestly, the biggest thing that I don't like about this is that I didn't get one sooner. Um, especially that amount of rebound is going to be a game changer in the amount of effort that it takes to do the work that I do. I'm uh, really pleased with the size. Um, I wouldn't want any larger, but different people do different work and have different requirements. So um, it does come as small as a, around 20 kilos all the way up to about 240 kilos, you know. Um, I like to call that one the Seth Wood pocket key ring. <laughs> he likes big animals. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm super pleased with it, very, very happy. And hopefully this video has given you a few insights into uh, what to look for when you yourself come time to buy an anvil uh, rather than, uh, that is new, rather than going for a second hand one. Um, I 
absolutely recommend this one. It's great. It's, it's doing everything that I want it to do and it's doing it very, very well. So I'm looking forward to a lot of work on it. And as you saw, I'm doing the sword build. So you're gonna see me doing some pretty heavy work for an anvil that's 40 kilos <laughs> to make an entire Viking sword. Uh, it's going to be a fun project and I'm really glad to have this anvil help me doing that. But thanks very much for coming along for the ride. As always, my links are in the description below. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Etsy, I'm on Patreon, and my lovely Patreon supporters will be listed at the end of this video. Uh, I stream on Twitch from time to time. I'm everywhere. You can get merch on Red Bull. <laughs> I'm like a bad smell, you can't get rid of me. Anyway guys, keep those forges lit, keep those hammers in hand, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.